there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. door opened there was a guy who was standing in the doorway i said i'd like to talk to you about this vehicle and he took a step to the left and he said i'll talk to you all right and at that time i yelled gun and i heard bang and I, as i was running i turned to see behind me and i bang and then i got hit something hit me in the face and then the other two started shooting at him and the way he described it was like a wild west shooter I think they just grabbed everything and, and fled. And he was looking for places to hide, so he did kick the door down, and he came in and was telling everybody to get up. We didn't even have time to say anything. We were told to go sit down, and she had a gun. Actually, I was more scared of her than I was of him. He cut the telephone cord so he couldn't phone anybody. We're all tied up. Then he took Dave's and then they left. Dave went down back roads to come to a doctor. We knew Archer had taken hostages and was holed up at the doctor's home. Looked in the phone book, there's a doctor. So I made the call, the man answered, said hello. I said, uh, hi, uh, I understand there's been some trouble there. And he said, I'm the guy that's causing the trouble. of Ferdon, Manitoba, Canada, and surrounding community of Oak Lake have settled in on a cold winter's night, unaware of what will soon transpire. I live in Oak Lake, Manitoba. My husband worked in the oil field there when we met and we got married. And then when I were here, I cooked for 30 years in the hotel in Vert. I joined the RCMP on 1st of February, 1967. In 76, I went to Verdun. The town of Verdun is located in the southwest corner of the Canadian province of Manitoba and has over 3,000 residents. Rushy, it's like more prairie type than you do up north. The bushes and, and good land, good farmland, and not big trees and just for agriculture. That's basically what it is. I'm a retired journalist. I used to work for the Winnipeg uh, Tribune as a reporter, a uh, police reporter. Breaking stories, uh, fires, plane crashes, uh, accidents, anything that, of the moment. It was very exciting, actually. For a young reporter from the North End, that was my background. Crime and accidents are always sort of uh, adrenaline pumping events. It was about mid-evening. I was patrolling just country roads, eh? And I stopped in to see a friend of mine who was in the rural area. And I would be before midnight sometime, I can't remember right off the bat. And I got a call on the radio from a fellow worker, Dennis Onifray. Senior Constable Russell Hornseth receives a call about a license plate check. A missing rental vehicle has been found parked at a local motel. Constable Hornseth decides to travel back to town and help with what he thinks will be a routine call. It's a very common practice in law enforcement for officers to conduct license plate checks. You get a wealth of information when you do these, from the registered owner information to the vehicle make. Whenever a license plate is run and something suspicious comes back on that plate, the police are going to enter into some sort of investigation to investigate that vehicle and the occupants or the driver of that vehicle. I said, OK, you wait and I'll be there. So I told my friend, uh, I've got to go back. So I jumped the car and I went to Burden 
And then while we were there, John and Candy came in the other police car. And uh, so I said, okay, well, we'll just go in and find out who they are. So we walked uh, up to the door in front of a big van. And we went in front of the van, there was a door to the room. Dennis was on, standing on my right, and John and Candy were on my left against the wall. And uh, I knocked on the door, and the door opened, there was a guy who was standing in the doorway, and he had his whole right shoulder, was against the door jamb. He was scruffy looking, dirty looking. So I said, uh, we'd like to talk to you about this vehicle. And he took a step to the left, put his arms come out and there was a shotgun in his hands and he said I'll talk to you all right and at that time I yelled gun and my gun was in the holster I turned it was head towards the front of the police car with the west side of the parking lot and I heard bang and as I was running I turned to see behind me and I bang and then I got hit Stuff hit me in the face, just bang. The gunman, Bruce Archer, is heavily armed and willing to shoot his way to freedom. Well, I knew then it was, the, he got me with a shotgun. I, I knew that then, because the, the, the different spots, eh? And I made it to the car and I went around the front of the car and another shot was fired. And I got in the west side of the car in the front door. Then I, to feel pellets, you could tell what they were. They were shooting under the car, trying to get to my feet. I could tell that. You could hear the way the pellets were going. So I went to the passenger's side door, opened the door, and leaned into the front to reach the radio. And then there was a bang, a couple of bangs that I knew weren't shotgun. They, they, I could tell that they were rifle shots. And I heard that and hit the car. So I figured he's trying to shoot me through the door or the fender because he knows I'm in the front of the car. So I just managed to get the radio and I called Brandon and told him 1033 that this is what happened. And then I backed out and I got behind the back wheel and I exchanged shots at that time because I had the gun out when I got behind the car. Blood from Constable Hornset's gunshot wound impedes his vision. Still, he fires back, trying to stop the shooter. Then the other two started shooting at him. He returned fire, and the way he described it was like a Wild West shooter. And then I couldn't see, and I was right in my face, and I had blood all over me, and I had a hard time seeing, and the, and the gun was all caked in blood. And then he would go in, back in, and then he'd stick the gun out and shoot, eh? So when he backed in, after he shot back, I ran to the corner of the building. And there's an L shape, and Candy was in the, in the corner. Well, she was trapped. But I said to her, I said, stay down, be quiet, and don't do anything because he doesn't know you're there. The police are under heavy fire as they continue waiting for backup. They make a plan, but will it be enough to contain the situation? And I called John, and he came up over to my side, up to me, and I said, John, Candy's in the corner there. Dennis is on the other side of the van. Now you sit right where I am. I got to the radio and I said, the help's coming. I can't even see Harvey, so I'm getting out of here before I fall down and collapse and cause you a problem. I moved away to go towards the hospital, and that's the way I went. And John was there, and it was dead quiet then. So I figured, well, it's covered. John's here, Candy's there, and she knows because I know what happened. If he found out she was there, he'd just stick the gun around the corner. So she was locked in that corner, eh, to get out. I joined the RCMP on 1st of February, 1967. 76, I went to Verdon. And I got a call on the radio from a fellow worker, Dennis Onifre. A call about an overdue rental vehicle at a local hotel sends senior constable Hornseth over to investigate. And uh, so I said, okay, well, we'll just go in and find out who they are. So we walked uh, up to the door. I knocked on the door, and the door opened. There was a guy who was standing in the doorway, and he had his whole right shoulder. It was against the door jamb. 
So he opened the door and shot the first police officer. Then the other two started shooting at him. He returned fire, and the way he described it was like a Wild West shooter. A break in the gunfire leads Archer and his accomplice, Dorothy Mallet, to attempt an escape. The wife was shot. She was shot in the abdomen. Though his wife, Dorothy, is injured, the duo managed to steal a police car. And one police officer was killed, and actually, they were expecting a baby. I did not find out about Dennis till a day later. I guess I didn't know he was dead until I was shot, till uh, after I was in the hospital. It had to have been the first blast because I heard a blast and then I turned and there was another blast where I got hit. And I find out after that he was there, so he got the first blast. He didn't have, he didn't even have time to think. Being shot at will elicit several different types of responses from even the best trained officers. In a situation like this, really it comes down to the human factor and their training. How does that officer react to those shots being fired? Is it a fight or flight type situation where they're gonna fight immediately or retreat, reevaluate, and then act on that situation? One lady police officer, she was shot in the stomach and they didn't know whether she was gonna make it for a while, but she did make it in, but she never ever did go back in. And then the third police officer got his eyes shot out. The fourth police officer, nothing happened to him. The gunman shoots his way out of the hotel, now on the run. The reason behind his violent reaction to the police at his door starts revealing itself. There had been a murder in Calgary. A businessman was found bound and uh, killed, and uh, Archer and his wife were the number one suspects. Dorothy Mallet was uh, the wife. It was not Bonnie and Clyde. She was not egging him on. She was, you know, whatever he wanted to do, she was with him. That was the relationship. That was that was why he uh, he loved her. Meanwhile, the injured constables get treatment for their gunshot wounds. Well, I go down there and and. Uh, well, they do the, what they do in the hospital. And so they said, well, we're going to Brandon. And then before I, we left, Candy was brought in and she was shot up very badly. Apparently he stuck his head out and she said something to the effect of stop or I'll shoot or something to that effect. I'm not positive what it was said, but something along those lines was said by her. And I guess then he knew she was there and he shot her. Police officers, I think they had two police cars there and. I think they just grabbed everything and, and fled. So this suspect is on the run. This is really going to cause him to act unpredictably to ensure he doesn't get captured by the police. And he was looking for places to hide, so he'd seen our farm on the number one highway and he stopped. He runs the car into a snowbank behind the house because trees around our place and he didn't want anybody to see it. And actually it was two or three o'clock in the morning and we had our door locked and he did kick the door down and he came in and was telling everybody to get up. Local law enforcement investigates a call on an overdue rental car in the town of Verdon, Canada. The door opened, there was a guy who was standing in the doorway and he had his whole right shoulder and it was against the door jam. He was scruffy looking. I said, we'd like to talk to you about this vehicle. And he took a step to the left, and he said, I'll talk to you, all right. And at that time, I yelled, gun. And I heard bang. And as I was running, I turned to see behind me, and I bang, and then I got hit. Something hit me in the face, just bang. The gunman and his wife steal a police car and around the run, but the body count continues as he's now killed a police officer and shot two others. And he was looking for places to hide, so he'd seen our farm on the number one highway and he stopped. And actually it was two or three o'clock in the morning and we had our door locked and he did kick the door down and he came in and was telling everybody to get up. They were both fairly short and heavier build. And we did have a dog too, and the dog was barking, and, but it was just a little dog. 
We were trying to make him be quiet, and actually the man said, leave him bark. So maybe that was some kind of relief from what he'd done, or it was normal. We didn't even have time to say anything. It just was all in a hurry. We were told to go sit down. They said we shot a police officer. I've never been in a situation like that, so to me it seemed like it was a lie that he said he shot a police officer. We were all very quiet, and he did say my wife was shot, and he didn't tell us why or anything, and she sat across the room with a gun. She was shot in the stomach. He wanted more guns, he wanted money, and we didn't actually have guns or money in the house, so, but then he let it pass because they already had guns. I think they stole some of the police officers' guns when they left. The farmer in this situation has to think quickly. He's thinking about protecting his family, protecting his wife. They don't say too much, they just cut these lamp cords. He seemed like he was sorry for what he was doing. When he tied the two girls up, he said sorry, you know, if he was doing it too tight, things like that. Archer sends the kids to their rooms. He now begins the negotiations with Dave and Irene, launching their plan. And he cut the telephone cord so he couldn't phone anybody. Meanwhile, the injured police officers are getting much needed medical attention for their gunshot wounds. Both her and I were in the ambulance, we went to Brandon, and then uh, got looked after. I never did know at that time how bad she was hit. She went in, but I didn't go till later. That's when they said they had to take my eye out, because it was buggered all up. But the pellets here, they're in my head here. I got one right on the bone here. If it had been a millimeter lower, that I'd have been blind. The shell is still stuck right on the bone there. And I got other shell fragments in my head. I was home sleeping and I got a phone call because they would call me on breaking stories. And this would have been a couple of hours after the shooting. I immediately, you know, told them to send the cab while I dressed. I went to the office and they kind of briefed me. I started just phoning around. In those days, you had a rural phone book and people's names. I phoned the gas station, because the gas station was always a good place to start. People, you know, gossip there, went there for coffee. He didn't know very much. Then I started phoning people at Randall. And, and of course, they were sleeping, or just getting up, and they didn't know very much. So I, I abandoned that. Desperate, with his wife badly wounded, the gunman needs to get her medical assistance immediately. He demands Irene Penny drive him to the nearest hospital, but Irene's husband, Dave, lies, saying Irene can't drive. They take Dave hostage instead. When they came, they did drive the car in the snowbank. They go out to our vehicle, and they're going to leave. He wouldn't let Dave drive. Archer was driving, and he drove into a snowbank. So they had to come back into the house then they brought her back in. Actually, I was more scared of her than I was of him because she seemed to be, maybe it was because she was shot, she was desperate or something. Once out of the snowdrift, the gunman and Dave go to steal another vehicle from a neighbor. And they left her at our house to guard us while they went to get another car. Dave took him across to Oak Lake to a farmhouse there because the guy that was taking Dave hostage wanted a different car. He didn't like to be seen in the same car. So they went and knocked on the door and they went in and tied them up and took one of their cars. And then they come back to our place and they picked up Miss Mallet and then they left. Now safe, Irene and her daughters take action. We're all tied up, just our hands. It was just cords off lights. When you tie somebody up with a light cord, you can pull your hands apart and, and we all got loose. And then I walked to the neighbors and then the police came out to our house. I was scared for Dave, 
but I was relieved because they were gone and my two girls are safe and, and I was safe. I knew Dave, he would control the situation and keep everything calm. They wanted Dave to take him to a hospital, but Dave warned them to keep off number one because that would be the place that they would find him if they did. So Dave went down back roads to come to Oak Lake to a doctor, and Dave knew there was a doctor here in Oak Lake. The gunman hopes the doctor can give his wife the medical attention she needs, but she's bleeding heavily from the bullet wound she received in the shootout. By that time, we knew Archer, the shooter, had taken hostages and was holed up at the doctor's uh, home. Looked in the phone book, there's a doctor listed in the phone, Dr. So-and-so. So I went to the editors, I said, okay, I've called everybody I can. Do you want me to call the doctor's home? Because I don't want to sort of upset the police or the, the shooter. You know, it's your call. They said, yes, go ahead. So I phoned and the phone rang a couple of times and the, and I thought at this time, this is two and a half hours after the shooting, that the RCMP would have diverted all the phone calls from the house so that they could control the communications. So I was thinking, oh yeah, well, I'll be talking to an RCMP officer. So I made the call, a man answered with a, a man with a deep voice answered and said, hello. I said, uh, hi, uh, I'm George Jacob from the Winnipeg Tribune. I understand there's been some trouble there. And he said, I'm the guy that's causing the trouble. On the run for murder, Bruce Archer and Dorothy Mallet once again escaped the police. They break into a farmhouse, taking local man Dave Penny hostage. We didn't even have time to say anything. We were told to go sit down. They said we shot a police officer and he cut the telephone cord so we couldn't phone anybody. They wanted Dave to take him to a hospital. We're all tied up. Just our hands, it was just cords off lights. When you tie somebody up with a light cord, you can pull your hands apart and, and we all got loose. And then I walked to the neighbors. Newspaper reporter George Jacobs called the doctor's house. We knew Archer had taken hostages and was holed up at the doctor's home. I looked in the phone book, there's the doctor. So I made the call. The man answered, said hello, I said, uh, hi, uh, I understand there's been some trouble there. And he said, I'm the guy that's causing the trouble. That threw me for a loop because I was not prepared to talk to them. So I started, you know, who, what, where, when, and why, just like what happened, uh, you know, why, why did you do this? And, and I was very concerned about not saying anything that would upset him. And that was in the back of my mind. So every question I asked, I filtered first. Am I asking it in a fashion that is not going to upset him? So we talked and he was actually more calm than I was. He was just dead calm. And answering all my questions. He asked me, how's the cop I shot? I knew the uh, RCMP officer was dead, but I didn't want to tell him. So I said, he's in Winnipeg, uh, undergoing surgery, and he's getting the best treatment possible. And that seemed to satisfy him. He went, okay, uh-huh. And uh, so we went on. He wanted to start a new life somewhere other than Canada. He wanted a plane, fly him to another country. He wanted $100,000 to stake him for a couple of months till he found a job in this other country. And then he was gonna fly there with his wife and change his name and get a job and start life all over again. And I was listening to this and you're going, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> 
He wanted an escort out of here to somewhere safe. He also wanted a lawyer, but I wasn't going to put him in touch with a lawyer. I said, you know, that's... That's not what I thought was a proper thing to do. Uh, I was going to leave that to the RCMP to worry about that. He did tell me you know, he, that I got, you got 20 minutes to talk to me because the doctor gave me something to keep me up, to keep me awake, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, the crazy in, in half an hour or 20 minutes. And by that time, people were starting to come into work. Like, we started at 8.30 in the morning. So people were coming in earlier and the usual morning routine. And I couldn't hear them because everybody's all around me. I didn't want to hang up yet because I, I thought, geez, you know, there, there might be something else I want to ask. So I started throwing paper clips at people to get their attention. To shut up, I've got them on the line. And it took a while, it took like five minutes before somebody noticed me and didn't think I was just an idiot throwing paper clips. And I said, I got him on a line. And they ran to the back to talk to one of the editors. The editor came over to me and was saying, keep him talking, keep him talking. We're going to tape it. And I'm like, okay. I was almost finished the interview. I was all set to say, well, thank you very much. And then I had to start all over again. So I said, uh, you know, I just to be clear, I just want to make sure I'm quoting you accurately. Can I uh, just clarify a few things? So I started the interview all over again. And so I talked to him for another 10 minutes or so at least while they uh, uh, hooked up the recorder. I started talking to him and they were taping and saying, okay, good. So I talked to him for a short while. Then one of the editors started uh, sort of interrupted and, and picked up the conversation mm -hmm. while I went and I wrote my story for the uh, morning edition. The police surround the doctor's home where Archer, the gunman, is holding hostages. They consider his recent violent history and decide it's best to wait him out no matter how long it takes. But inside, Archer's wife is in bad shape, bleeding from her gunshot wound. Dr. Schur said he couldn't do anything because it was a gunshot wound and he didn't have the stuff. The doctor tried to give the woman some treatment, but she was bleeding quite severely, so they needed to call in an ambulance and get her to a hospital. She was unconscious, I believe. She'd uh, lost so much blood. They were anxious to get an ambulance there. The RCMP called an ambulance, but they were not allowed to approach the house because he was armed. So the doctor finally got fed up and he didn't want her dying there. So he phoned the local ambulance and gave them hell and said, get over here. So they came over and came up to the house and took her to the Brandon Hospital. And then they moved her to Winnipeg. Our ambulance people were excellent. They picked up Miss Mallet when none of the other ambulances would because they didn't want to get themselves shot or whatever, you know. And you never knew what was on his mind. It was very tense because if the hostage taker found out that something happened to his wife, they didn't know what would happen to them in the house because he was very attached to her. So if something happened to her, they feared for themselves that way. Dave is a very calming person. And I think that's why when they were taken hostage, I think Dave kept everything normal and calm, or it might have been a different outcome if you'd have got somebody that was more agitated and stuff. I knocked on the door, and the door opened, and at that time I yelled, gun! And I bang, and then I got hit. Something hit me in the face, just bang. And the way he described it was like a Wild West shootout. They came out and ran across the parking lot and got in the police car. The wife was shot while running. And then they left with the car. And he was looking for places to hide, so he did kick the door down and he came in and was telling everybody to get up. They wanted Dave to take him to a hospital Dave went down 
back roads to come to Oak Lake to a doctor. Dr. Schur said he couldn't do anything because it was a gunshot wound. The doctor finally got fed up and he didn't want her dying there. So he phoned the local ambulance and gave them hell and said, get over here. So they came over and came up to the house and took her to the Brandon Hospital. Right after I finished writing my story, uh, they said, okay, you know, uh, grab some stuff. You're going out there. It was the photographer and me, and I, there was one other reporter, I think the three of us went, and we drove out there and uh, parked ourselves in the hotel. It was the type of winter that you did not want to be outdoors. The house was staked out during the hostage taking, and we were uh, assigned, get a, a, a feel for the town, you know, talk to people. Well, there were no people. Th there was nothing, this is a small town. So there, w once you couldn't move around, you stayed home. It was too cold to just wander the streets. Meanwhile, the gunman hasn't slept for 36 hours, and the doctor's injecting him with amphetamines to keep him awake. They shut the schools down, they evacuated people from around the Schur's home where they, the hostages were. The police took over our cafe here in Oak Lake as their headquarters. That's where they did all their business from. It was four long days because you never knew when something was going to happen. So you're always on edge. You could never relax. Like when you slept, we slept in shifts. And even then, you slept very fitfully because you were always afraid you were going to miss something. So I could hear what, what the RCMP were saying uh, to each other. And, you know, you could just tell from the tone of voice. It was all very calm. When you think about it, you have to keep an eye on people while your eyes are closing from sleep. So we were surprised that, that, that this lasted that long, four days. Dragging into its fourth day, the drugged up hostage taker's behavior starts to turn erratic. Even though we had a room, I slept on chairs. I remember pulling three chairs together and just sleeping on that chair because I just wasn't gonna get undressed because something might happen. And uh, you know, whoever was in the room, uh, we alternated uh, you know, sort of shifts. Whoever would listen to the police radio, the others would go down, have a bite to eat, you know mingle with the other reporters. The gunman worries something bad has happened to his wife. He demands to speak with her, but the police refuse. Mrs. Schur was cooking the meals for them, but he said Archer didn't sleep. He stayed awake and made sure they didn't leave or stuff like that. Apparently he had catnaps, uh, we were told later. Nobody was willing to, 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 to risk challenging him, going after him. Desperate to communicate with his wife, Archer attempts to telepathically connect with her. The drugs, exhaustion, and stress are clearly wearing on his sanity. The gunman insists his attempts to communicate with his wife aren't working because of the sedative the doctors likely have her on. This man has killed an RCMP officer. He knows he's cornered. You don't know how desperate he is. And all you did was sit and drink coffee and wait. Because at any minute, you didn't know whether the police were gonna storm the place, whether he was gonna try and shoot his way out. The wisest thing to do was just, you know, wait it out. The RCMP uh, seemed to be happy uh, with the way things went. In other words, they could sense his mood. The RCMP start cutting off services to the home. First, they cut off the water, then the electricity. They keep the phone active. The surrender is imminent. I had the police radio. That was our advantage. The only time that paid off was about 10 minutes before he surrendered. There was a, a negotiator, an RCMP negotiator. He, he wasn't happy with that. He wanted to talk to the RCMP commissioner, the top guy. They agreed to let him see his wife. And that was the uh, final straw that, that he said, okay. 
If anything, he was very concerned about her. He, he really wanted her to recover. And of course, he knew nothing, because uh, the radio stations were keeping things up to date, but he didn't get a daily update on her condition. So one of the radio stations actually phoned uh, a lawyer to represent him, and the lawyer came out and uh, negotiated uh, the surrender. I heard on the police radio, he's given himself up. And uh, so I came down, I was the only one with the police radio. Uh, none of the other news outlets had one. So I came down and I'm trying to get the attention of, of, my, of our photographer, like, he's, you know, uh, I didn't want to say he's given himself up because I didn't want to give it up to the uh, everybody. But uh, he was ignoring me, he was too busy talking <laughs> with the other guys. And then finally the RCMP came in and said, uh, okay, guys, he's agreed to surrender. Uh, we're going to give you all a chance to get a picture. We're going to drive him past such and such a corner, be there at five minutes to the hour. When Archer finally agreed to come out, Mrs. Schur and Dave walked one in front and one behind to protect him so the police wouldn't shoot him. They got to be very protective of Archer. I think it was called Stockholm Syndrome. So Stockholm Syndrome is essentially when a hostage creates a bond with their hostage taker and becomes sympathetic to their cause. We all stood around on that corner. They drove them by and people just snapped shots because they didn't know what they were getting. Then right after that, we drove to Winnipeg and not knowing whether we had a picture of him or not. And when we got here, the, the photographer developed it, and sure enough, he had a picture of him looking out the window. It all ended very well. They all came out of it without anybody else being killed. It took people quite a while to get back to normal, but it did end well. Nobody else was hurt. I was taken down to the hospital. They'd taken Dave to the hospital. So it was four days after, and they had him at the hospital, and they phoned me I could come down because he was being released, so. And even after, I remember talking to him about him, and, and he, like, I was really upset for what this archer had done, and Dave did not want to hear me criticize him or saying he shouldn't have done it. It took quite a while for Dave to get over that. being protective of him. We couldn't take him, he had to go to the police station and he had to give a report and he was there for hours, given all his, all the details and stuff. So I didn't see him till maybe noon the next day. We came back to our farm after that. We had to go to court and they had court in Brandon and we were closed in a little room to give our testimonies and stuff. And we spent days sitting in the court. At the trial, the gunman claims the reason he opened fire on the police was because he felt threatened by them. When I was given evidence at the trial, the lawyer says, did you converse or something with him? Did you yell at him? And I said, yes, I did. Because when I was behind the car, I was yelling at him. I called him some nasty names. And he said, did you do that? And I said, yeah, I did. But nobody ever said anything more about it. He went to trial, uh, pleaded not guilty, was convicted of first-degree murder for killing a police officer, was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years with no parole, and uh, died in prison. Uh, after, I think he must have served like almost 20 years. I saw her after she was arrested, and I saw her again 15 years later. She was 
applying for early release. She had also been convicted of a first degree murder. Everybody, even the Crown attorney said that she changed her life. She was living a very clean existence as a prisoner. And they had no objections to her getting early parole. And uh, she, was, she was granted early parole. So she was, uh, served 16 years. This is a one of a kind. Uh, how often does any reporter talk to a, a murderer uh, within hours of him having committed the crime and while he's holding hostages? That is literally, I, I can't think of another situation where that's happened. And you don't ever want to have that happen again because there's a lot of pressure on you uh, as a reporter not to make things worse. It's always in your mind. Did you do the right thing? Years later, I think I think about it more now than I did 10 years ago. It enters my mind to do the right thing. And you're still not 100% sure. If I think about it, I should have maybe had my handgun in my hand, but you do things for years and years and years the same way, and then all of a sudden, it bites you. I didn't even know Dennis was dead till I was in the hospital. And you start thinking again, oh Christ, what could, what could I have done? And what's the first thing you think of? Well, if I shoot him, well, I'm gonna be in trouble. But if I don't, I'm gonna be dead. There's things like that that make you uh, very leery of how to handle things. You don't get time to think about it. It's instant. So you die or live in an instant. They can sit down and say, okay, when this happens, you do this and you do this. When that happens, you do this. And if you shoot somebody, we're going to investigate in case you made a mistake. All that goes through your head in a tenth of a second. What do you do? Everybody's going to do something different. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that people can reminisce about. They should have done this, you should have done that. Well, maybe you should have.